All right, everyone. Welcome to the F World Headquarters podcast. I am your host with the most, the F World icon, Sean Jazz Stevens. And we are very happy and blessed to introduce you guys shortly to a man who has helped me in the career of many, that being Shella Goldberg. We're just waiting for him. Uh, first and foremost, let's give him a round of applause. Excellent. All right, everyone, let's welcome my good friend, longtime friend, Sheldon Goldberg to the F World Headquarters podcast. And he'll be joining us shortly. <laughs> Good morning. Not connecting audio. <laughs> hey, Sean. Good morning. How are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I am fantabulous. Thank you. Oh, there you are. You handsome devil, you. I don't know how you're doing. Ah, how are you? I just live right. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. Oh, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. You know, I figured, you know, if I'm going to have anyone on the podcast, as far as wrestling goes, I might as well start with a man who knows more about wrestling than I'll ever will. Wow. <laughs> so I want to welcome you're you. Too to kind. The I want to welcome you officially to the F World Headquarters podcast, and uh, mm -hmm. there should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to this, and, and I hope you are. I'm, as well. I'm pleased to be here. Well, we're honored to have you. Well, Sheldon, mm -hmm. before I, you know, before you know, we get you know huge into things, I want you to, if you could, to explain to the people who have lived under a rock, maybe a little bit, why they may uh, may not have heard where they should have known your name, Sheldon Goldberg. Well, a lot of people know me from uh, being the promoter of New England Championship Wrestling for over 20 years. Uh, they might have known me from being on uh, TV specials like uh, a &E Network's Unreal Story of Professional Wrestling and Andre the Giant Larger Than Life. Um, if they go further back, they might have known me from uh, being a theater producer. Um, but, you know, I've kicked around a lot of different things. So... If you know me, you know me. If you don't, well, it's nice to meet you. It's only a matter of time, right? Right. And you've recently got into the book writing world, which is amazing as well. How's that? How is yeah. that? Yeah. You? Yeah. Well, let me tell you. I, I thirteen months ago, I, I I was on a plane home from Las Vegas from a uh, uh, Cauliflower Alley Club reunion, and I was on the plane, and my kidneys failed. Mm. And I was in the hospital for about a month, and I'm, I'm laying there at Mass General in the hospital, and I'm saying, I can't go out like this. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And whatever that something is, I'm going to try to make an impact with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, after uh, I got out of the hospital, I, I went back to work for about six months, and then I retired from that, and now I just started doing other creative projects, the first of which to emerge is this book, The Last Fall. So um, I'm very proud of it, very pleased with it, and very pleased with the reaction that it's gotten from people so far. That's very exciting, man. And you know what? First yeah. of all, I'm glad you're okay. God bless that you're alive. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. The world wouldn't be the same without you. So we appreciate that. Um, that must have been a scary time for you. But you know what? I I get that. You know, what do you do? You know, you're so used to something for so long. You know, I can understand how that could be. Well, you know, I, I wasn't going to quit and give up. I was going to pick myself up, dust myself off, and then figure out what I could do and do it. So there you have it. Sure. Sure. Now, now, Grant, I've seen a lot of your work and I've known you for a number of years. Uh, growing up in the New England area, I think anyone who's been in the New England area has been to a, a show, especially a New England Championship Wrestling show, can say that mm -hmm. you were probably one of the most synonymous people in New England. Um, and I believe you did know my trainer, former, you know, the WE Hall of Famer, Killer Kowalski, I believe you are. Sure, very well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep, and very well. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind, um, because I've, I've talked about 
you know, kill her way too much more. I'm sure my viewers are sick of listening to my stories about them, but I, but because you're a little bit old, you have been around a little longer than I have. Maybe you could maybe tell some Sheldon, Gold, uh, some, you know, Sheldon Goldberg's, Sheldon Goldberg's point of view on the great killer Kowalski, perhaps. Well, you know, he was one of the greatest of all time. I mean, he's one of those guys whose name was synonymous with pro wrestling for many, many years. And uh, I mean, how could you, how could you not think of the name Killer Kowalski and not think of pro wrestling? You'd have to have, you know, lived in a cave or something sure. to, to not have, you know. But the thing about Walter was just how kind he was and, yeah. and how welcoming to people and so forth. And just, um, you know, what a great man he was. And, you know, I, I always uh, would, you know, kind of look at guys who were around him. Oh, Walter this, Walter that. Hey, what are you talking about, Walter? This guy's one of the greatest of all time. Seriously. How do you treat him like like he's your next door neighbor? Yeah. I mean, maybe he made you feel that way in some way, shape, or sure. form. But no, this guy was one of the greatest of all time. Ever, he ever, ever. He yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people don't understand that. And he was a very giving person. You're correct. He was very giving, Mm -hmm. a wealth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he never was shy about not being offered, not being able to pass that on to somebody else. Right. If you wanted to learn something, you could talk to Walt. I mean, he was, he was always available. And he was very generous with his knowledge too. He's very generous with that knowledge. You could ask him about anyone from any time period and, and he'd give you his honest opinion about them. Sure. And you know what? I think that's a rare thing. I mean, especially mm-hmm. today in wrestling. Uh, right. There's a lack of that these days. <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, I think it's, it's safe to say, I mean, Cole Kowalski, Walt, you know, Walter to some, he is known synonymous in the wrestling world for many things, not just for being one of the greatest of wrestling of all time, but also producing and training some of the best of all time. I mean, right. I think, I mean, it's kind of like yourself. I mean, there's a lot of people who have crossed through the New England Championship Wrestling realm who you could probably rattle off 700 names of people who've been through your camp who have mm-hmm. gone on to do bigger things. And what is that like for you as a promoter to see that? Well, it's gratifying. You know, you that that's the idea of, of you know, being a, an independent promoter. You're, you know that the guys that are working for you, that you're just a way station for them. Sure. You know, hopefully you're giving them an experience that they can take something away from that's uh, positive for them and get on to bigger and better things. And uh, and it happened in a lot of and even some of the ones who didn't necessarily were, were great performers, were, were great wrestlers. And uh, we have a project coming up. My next project after this one is going to be a, a, a video project called New England oh. Championship Wrestling, The Lost Matches Live. Oh, and man. what that is, is we're going to take about a half dozen or so matches that are not on YouTube, some of which have never been seen before, other than if you were there live. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to put them together in a program and we're going to show them in a movie theater with a live Q&A afterwards. Oh, that's exciting. So, that's yeah. Exciting. So that's yeah. A, that's something very unique. I, I try to pride myself on doing things that are different and unique. And uh, this is one of them. And I'm I'm looking forward to that. You know, I really like that, and I respect a lot of that. And like I said, you got to innovate. And one of the things in the wrestling world is you have to either evolve and set yourself apart from everybody else. There are a lot of promoters out there who want to produce and put on a show. Uh, but there are so many people who just think this is how wrestling is, and they follow that kind of scrapbook what they think it is. But they right. get stuck in that, and they're afraid to venture out. Uh, mm-hmm, me, for example, mm-hmm. when I thought I was done wrestling, you know, silly me thinking I was done with wrestling. Um, I figured in 2019, I'm walking away from the thing and there's not going to be jazz fitness anymore. I'm all set. Uh, my body's too old, blah, blah, blah. And then, unfortunate, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, that's how I discovered YouTube. And my son, who was sick from school when he was 11, um, you know, I wanted to cheer him up. So we used a wrestling game to build I'm sure you've seen a lot of our, you may have seen some of our stuff, but be, to cheer him up, I built Peter Griffin from Family Guy and Homer Simpson from, the, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so forth. So, I, you know, we wanted to see, you know, when it came to putting the match together in the wrestling show, we found out it could go to demo. 
and the system would pick the winner. And my son said, we should put this on YouTube. He said, when he was 11, I said, people aren't going to want to watch wrestling video game stuff on YouTube when he was 11. Mm. <laughs> he was 21, by the way, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> wow. And since then, we've been kind of, you know, YouTube says we're the first in that genre, which is interesting. And the thing that the fact of doing it with my son and teach him kind of that thing, you know, that aspect and how to run and book things like that. But also something I've been trying to do for a while is educate people about the classics of wrestling. Cause without people like Kowal Kowalski or, you know, these great legends that people may or not know today, none mm-hmm. of us would be, I wouldn't be in this business today if it wasn't for people before me, there had to be somebody to spark that interest. You know what I mean? Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm curious you know, one of the things I've always wondered, what got you interested in pro wrestling? Way, you know, when did your love for pro oh, wrestling gosh. start? You were, I, you was were eight, I was about eight years old mm-hmm. when I discovered pro wrestling and there was Bruno San Martino. And, you know, I think it, it's funny because I think if you didn't live through Bruno's era, you, you can't really get a grasp of of how big and how important he was and what a hero he was to people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was just bigger than life and he was the Charles Atlas story come to life. You know, the, the 98 pound weekly who came to America after world war II as an immigrant and built himself up and became literally one of the strongest men in the world. And, you know, that, that, that classic picture of Bruno with a championship belt. And he's like, you know, like that, yep. that, that was the world heavyweight champion. Right. Anybody in this, in this part of the country looked at that picture, world heavyweight champion. That was it. He was it. And, and, you know, if you, in Bruno's heyday, if you were to walk through the North end on a night where pro wrestling was in the garden, the streets would be empty because all the Italians would be in the garden cheering right. on Bruno. Mm-hmm. That was he had such a bond with his fans, not just Italians, but any immigrants and, and even people like myself who are not immigrants. I mean, he was the man. And um, I think if you didn't live through that era, you you can't quite get a grasp of just what a big star Bruno San Martino was. Well, sure. absolutely. Mm. And you know what you said? Like, do you remember the first time you saw a live wrestling show? Oh, yeah. I was in the garden. Of course. Mine too. Oh. Bruno San Martino versus Gorilla Monsoon. It was the night the ring broke. <laughs> and that wasn't, by, that wasn't a gimmick either. It, it legitimately. No. Was. And, and, and you, you, yeah, I, little old, uh, you know, 12 year old me thought that had any thought that this stuff was fake. Oh, no, that wasn't fake. That they, right. they just broke that ring. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I think what's interesting, I've told the stories you know, on the show about how, where I became a wrestling fan going live. It also mm-hmm. was, the, it was also when I decided this is what I'm going to do one day. Thank prior God. to that, you know, I studied martial arts prior to that. And I loved competing in that, but I was also skinny. I was scrawny. I was short. And the pro wrestling in going to my first wrestling show was also at the garden. But what I find what was interesting is one of the things that I thought set me a little bit different is it wasn't the main event that sold me on wrestling. It was the opening match. It was, get here's some names, Leaping Lenny Poffo mm-hmm. versus, I know you know these names, Leaping Lenny Poffo versus Steve Lombardi prior to becoming the Brooklyn Bar, the Brooklyn Brawler. You remember the- Wow, okay. This is yep. back when Lenny Poffo was throwing the Frisbees out into the crowd. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I've got one of those in here in my closet somewhere. I bet you do. But I... that was the match that actually turned me into a wrestling fan, believe it or not. That was okay. the amazing, the fluidness of everything, the storytelling. And I was only, mm-hmm. what, seven or eight years old in that match. The main event was Hogan and Boss Man for the title. Okay. I was going to ask DQ. you that. What was the main event? That was the main yeah. event. But, you know, yeah. another thing about that set me a little differently is I wasn't really sold on the Hulk Hogan thing. I know there are people who love Hulk Hogan. And one mm-hmm. of the things mm-hmm. about that makes wrestling great is I think one of the things that sets pro wrestling different than any other sport or any other you know fandom is you can be passionate about, you know, this guy or that guy. And you're still in the same kind of aspect. You know what I mean? 
Right. You could be mm-hmm. a Hogan fan, but you could be a Flair fan. Cool. They're completely different. <laughs> right. Uh, you right, know, right. aspects. But me personally, as far as the WWE goes at that time, or F at that point, I mm-hmm. was, you know, I was amazed by the storytelling by that opening match, or what my uncle called them jobbers, as he called them, or what did he call them? Mm-hmm. He, that's what he called them. He was a wrestling fan. But mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I actually understood, and you know, as I got in the wrestling world and I got, started training, how important those people were to the oh, yeah. of people like Hulk Hogan. It wasn't for like the Mario Mancini's and the Jose Luis Rivera's of the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, a lot mm-hmm. of those big stars wouldn't look as big as they are. I mean, personally, right. I, I mean, I get the Hogan thing. Hogan was huge back in the eighties and, you know, he's mm-hmm, synonymous mm-hmm. with the WWF at that time. But personally me, I like the people who tell a story who actually work. Um, like I thought one of the best promos, I don't know if you, I'm curious your thoughts. One of the people I thought did one of the best promos was Jake Roberts. And oh, absolutely. Sure. Different about jake roberts was he didn't scream and yell like all these other guys he told a story and it wasn't mm-hmm. loud and he told something and you believed what he was going to say because it was cold and methodical it doesn't right. matter if it was heel or face you believed what jake roberts said he didn't scream and yell do you know mm-hmm. what i mean i'm curious mm-hmm. what your thoughts are on you know as talking goes and performance goes like do you are there oh some- yeah i'm your favorite wrestler would probably be Bruno San Martino, would you say? Or is there someone? Yeah, better? sure, sure. Um, no, Bruno was the, in, in his era when I was growing up, he was the biggest. Sure. Absolutely. He was the biggest. Yeah, yeah. Now, if, but I you know, know it, you talk about promos. I mean, there were always guys who were, who were great promos. But what, what a great promo has, all the elements of a great promo boil down to one thing, and that's sincerity. Right. Exactly. If you can make the audience believe what you're saying, then they'll buy into it. Sure. A lot of guys today don't understand that because they don't. everything is scripted and written out for them. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have to come up with it off the top of their head and make it and make yeah. it resonate, make it real. You know, and that one of the things I have always been thankful for Kowalski and you know, I'm gonna I don't know if they still do that. Actually, the school doesn't exist anymore, Kowalski's school. Um, mm-hmm. I think last I heard, I think was it Top Rope took that over, a chaotic one of the two. Chaotic, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a while, but one of the things that Kowalski did for me, and was Wagner Brown was also one of my trainers and was mm-hmm. an mm-hmm. author. So, yeah. one of the things we did is that helped me in my promo skills was at the end of the pr- the training session, I would have to cut a promo on everybody in the class. So if they were heel. I would have to cut a face promo through a face. I had to cut a Uh heel promo and I had to do that at the end of each promo. Cause I actually growing up, I was Mm -hmm. very shy. I would never, you know, granted I was the person who, you know, would fight with people or, and I did, you know, stand up for the kids who were getting bullied and stuff like that. Cause I'm not, someone's going to watch someone get bullied. When I told Mm -hmm. Kowalski, you know what they called me in high school, he said, that's who you are. (laughs) That's who you're going to be. You know, Mm -hmm. you are Mm -hmm. jazz vengeance. You're the guy who, you know, you're the voice of the people. You're the person who intervenes when nobody else will. Um, and, you know, whether they're big or small or how big they are, mm-hmm. vengeance comes for everybody. So that was the right. idea. But one of the things that I really attribute a lot of my promo skills to him. And then years later, when I, you know, got after I got injured, as it happens in wrestling, and I came back as the jazz fitness thing, I still had those things. Kind of like riding a bike, kind of. <laughs> wrestling mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, you know i helped out with that that com- and a company that unfortunately is no longer exists as, as you as you're aware the wrestling business unfortunately there are ones that open and close and you know one of the things i respected about new england champion wrestling is how you guys still maintain you know a solid fan base and a solid grounding you know what i mean i really respect a lot of that uh i know Thank a lot you. of the guys who you work with and i've had some time over there myself, which I'm grateful for. Um, and one of the things that that made Jazz Fitness the character, because I didn't think that I could get over as a heel. I said, I don't mm-hmm. think people are going to mm-hmm. believe that I'm a bad guy. But one of the things that I thought was amazing is the fact that, you know, the promoter just put, you know how it goes, just before time, they're like, okay, you're, this has been changed and that's been changed. Now you got, you know, instead of a five-minute promo session, because I had the fitness center, the in-ring talk show thing, Mm-hmm. Um, 
they said, you're going to have now three minutes instead of five. Okay. But we still were able to do that. And it wasn't scripted. We didn't talk it out. And I just went out there and bing, bing, boom. And, and unfortunately, Jazz Fitness was a heel. He was, I was actually pretty good at channeling that heel. But mm. to circle back, if it wasn't for the skills that I learned from, you know, the, the training that I got, the being able to tell a story and the promos and believability, none of that would have believed when it would have happened. So, right. Uh, I think they're important. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, Sheldon, so your new book, uh, The Last Fall. I don't want to give away too much because, you know, I want people to read it, especially I'm going to read it myself. Right, right. And I'm going to be going to your launch party, which is coming up. Are you excited about the launch party? Very excited about it. Very excited. About it. I'm going to see a lot of people who are very important to me and have a chance to share this uh, this book with them. And I'm very excited about it because I'm very proud of the book. You know, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to write a full length novel. But I did, and uh, I'm happy with the way that it came out. And so far, everyone who's read the book has raved about it, which I'm extremely grateful for. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it, too, when you get a chance to read it. I'm very much looking forward to it. And one of the things that, you know, I'm going to go to your, I'm going to be there, of course. And, mm -hmm. you know, as someone who also loves writing, I've been, I've loved writing since I was very young. But as I've mm -hmm. talked to you before mm -hmm. about one of the things that my biggest block is, I lose interest in myself, let alone anything else. But like a short story, I could do no problem. But writing a book that has the, the same consistency, I lose interest in it because I'm like, okay, well, and I'm also what they call a pants writer, like meaning that I write everything in one shot. So writing mm -hmm. a novel, I'm sure you can understand that writing a, oh, yeah. sure you couldn't write your book in one sitting. But I love writing. So what was something that helped you in your journey, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, the writing journey? Yeah. What helped you? Well, how? I mean, obviously not being able to, you know, do it that, you know, putting your energy in from one thing to the other, because you've always been a workhorse when it came right. to, you know, being a promoter and all the other stuff. But right. how did that apply to writing a book? Um. It, it was a lot of discipline involved, um, but it was a joyful thing. It wasn't a chore at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, this book came together, really. The first draft of this book came together in three weeks. It was very quick. I I, I have to tell you, I have a, a friend. He's no longer with us, and he wrote a couple of books. His name is Howard Brody. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard was at one time the uh, president of the National Wrestling Alliance. We were oh. friends for many years. I worked with him and the late hero, Matt Suda, on a project called Ring Warriors back in the late 90s. And Howard and I were very close. Howard was like the brother I never had. And uh, Howard wrote two books. The first one, he collaborated with Dusty Rhodes on Dusty's autobiography, Reflections of an American Dream. Mm -hmm. And then he had a second book, which was more an autobiographical book about his experience in wrestling called Swimming with Piranhas. <laughs> and uh, as he was writing those books, he would send me chapters. Well, what do you think about this? And, you know, what, what should I do with this or blah, blah, blah. And, and he would always say to me, he says, Shelly, you got to write a book. You, you got to write one of these days. You got to write a book. And I, I never got around to it because I was always too busy. And now that I'm, I'm a little bit more at leisure, uh, I was able to tackle it. And I really believe that Howard was kind of on my shoulder. You know, the spirit of Howard was there with me as I was putting this book together. I know there's some things in the book that he would just laugh at lo out loud at. <laughs> and there are other things in the book. He's ah, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that the, the spirit of Howard really helped me write the book. Are you able to tell people maybe a, a synopsis perhaps maybe, or what the book was to be about or without giving away too much? Yeah, sure. I, I can give you a little synopsis without giving anything away. It's the story yeah, it's the story of a wrestler by the name of Rick Pacheco. Now, this book is fiction. It is not fact. It is fiction. So it follows Rick, Rick Pacheco's journey through professional wrestling from literally stumbling into the business at the age of 11 years old in 1971 to the end of his in-ring career in 1999. And it's a tale of... Uh, how can I put this? It's a tale of of um, the wrestling business. <laughs> uh, it's a it's it's a tale of um, 
I had this right on the tip of my tongue earlier. But it, it, it's triumph, tragedy, and redemption hmm. is what happens in this book. You, you follow his journey through his career. That sounds awesome. Through uh, the, the getting into the business and so forth and, and becoming a big star. Then all of a sudden, all of that changing. And then his, his road to redemption and happiness. So uh, I, I think it, it, it's a tale that anyone, even if you're not a wrestling fan, can relate to. Mm-hmm. But if you are a wrestling fan, you'll you'll dig it. You really will. Sure, sure. No, that's understandable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm very excited to read it. Um, you know, I think it'll be very good and very, you know, all honesty. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to watch that TV show Heels at all. Have you ever watched that? Have you yes, watched? I did. Mm-hmm. What are your yep. thoughts on that TV show Heels out of curiosity? Because I thought there are a lot of the aspects that I can relate to myself. I've, I've seen a lot of that. And there's some things obviously mm-hmm. that are Hollywood based from someone's perspective of that hearing your description of the book, kind of an idea kind of doubt those kinds of ideas kind of pop in my head. Cause I can actually view a lot of that. So in what other people perspect, what the wrestling world is, I'm curious your thoughts yeah. on a show like heels and how it's usually perceived. Well, the thing about Heels is that it, it, it's a Hollywood writer's version of what pro wrestling is. Sure. And, and some of it bears, you know, bears a resemblance to reality, and, and a lot of it didn't. Uh, I think The Last Fall bears much more of a resemblance to reality of mm-hmm. what wrestling was and it, it had become mm-hmm. uh, than you're, you're going to see in a thing like Heels. That's why I think that... Uh, there, there might be a possibility of an afterlife for the last fall as a, you know, a movie or a, a limited series or whatever on Netflix or writing Amazon. A follow up to this, perhaps? Is it going to be a follow up? Do you think? I don't know. The, it, the, the the book ends where it's supposed to end. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't think there's a sequel in the book. So I might do another. I, I might do another wrestler story. A complete. I actually started writing a completely different story before I. I happened on this and said oh okay well uh, i like this idea and and i can see the whole thing Mm -hmm. so that's why i i stopped that original idea and went ahead and wrote the last fall makes sense i mean i get that and you know i I can understand that better than a lot i'm i've I'm a very I'm very particular when it runs comes to writing. I am very, you know, a lot of people don't understand what that thing of writing is. I'm very I'm a very much a perfectionist when it comes to writing. If it's something that I know people right. don't read, I want to make sure it's perfect. I, I have no problem just stop stopping right in the middle of writing a. I can write seven pages and say nope, I'm done. I've got to do this over again. I don't like it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and because I want it to be good, and I think for myself. Whenever I write anything, it's, you know, how to, how do I invoke that feeling out of the reader? How do I reach that, re- you know, not knowing who's going to read it or how that's going to, you know, how do I get that feeling out of that person? You know what I mean? And for me, I mean, I'm sure, you no, know, now that you've seen, you've heard some of the reviews of your book and stuff, that must be gratifying for yourself. I'm oh my guess, God. Right? Uh, oh my God. So much so. You know, I really wrote it. Because, A, I wanted to to write kind of a love letter to pro wrestling and the pro wrestling life. But right. but I also wrote it just because I wanted to see that if I could see if I could. And now you know and, you and, can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm so the whole process has been so incredibly gratifying. And, and for people to embrace the book and to really rave about it as they have is just the icing on the cake. I mean, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. Um, you know, there, there's writing a book and then there's promoting it, like an appearance like this, right. where I'm, I'm talking to you about the subject and so forth. Sure. And but uh, that's a, a long haul situation. People say, "Oh, when are you going to write the next one?" <laughs> well, I got to produce promote this one first. Yeah, I, yeah. I got to get this in as many people's hands as I can get it into. And sure. Um, you know, but but this whole thing has been just an absolute joy. I, I you have no idea. You know, I, I thought, I, I didn't know, when I was laying in that hospital bed 13, 14 months ago, I had no idea what, what my future was going to be, or even if I was going to have a future. And to sort of kick out of that and then do something like this, it's just, uh, man, it's, it's just really soul satisfying in a, in, a, in a big way. Absolutely. And I think what's really impressive there is the fact 
in real life, I mean, that's a story in itself, the redemption story for yourself. You know, 11, not long ago, you didn't know what your life was going to be. You didn't know what was going to happen in, in that must've been scary. Number one, but the same sense of the fact that you overcame that to get to where you are, that is impressive. The fact that you survived well, you. and you kicked all that, that is a resurrection story, but that's a survival story. And mm. that to me is a more important thing to me. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've got, I got three lessons for people when, when, when they look at all this and, and listen to what I, I've been telling you. And that is you're never too old. It's never too late. And you can do great things if you put your mind to it. Those three things, keep those three things in mind and, and you'll those be okay. Those are fantastic lessons right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hope mm -hmm. that's true because uh, next year I, I've decided that, you know, since my kids were really too young to really get to enjoy um my wrestling stuff i've made that unfortunate or fortunate decision to go back into pro wrestling because i'm a clown <laughs> mm. but um you know i'm glad you said that because uh you know i was almost like i don't know if i'm too old to go back into pro wrestling again but you know hearing those was very inspiring well, and how old are you i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna be 44 in march well, hey man, I'm 67, so you know I'm 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 no spring chicken here. Yeah. That's why I say I don't know what you know what was going to be, but sure, uh, I'm certainly certainly not going to be doing anything physical, but but mental, I've got a handle on. I feel like jazz fitness might have you know I toyed with back and forth. I don't think necessarily jazz vengeance is coming back anytime soon, but mm -hmm. jazz fitness on the other hand, and I don't understand what I, I'll personally on all the side. I don't understand how it is that the heel character is more popular than the face character. I don't understand how that works. Um, you've been in the wrestling world a long time. Maybe you can shed light on why the heel sometimes is more popular than the face is. Do you know why? I, I think like that, that the heel. Uh, yeah, I do. I, I think that, that in today's society, people live vicariously through the antics of someone who, who gets away with doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's a societal thing. It started really, you can trace that back to the Road Warriors. Yeah, really? The Road Warriors were the first really cool heels. You know, the guys who came out and they were so bad that you couldn't help it. Like, oh my God, look at these guys. Right. They were so impressive that, that even though you were supposed to boo them, you didn't. You wouldn't dare. <laughs> right. Now, a lot you of people... You go even further back than that to superstar Billy Graham. Right. And that that's someone who a lot of people, you know, today... You might hear a little bit here and there. You don't, you know, heel heat today is different than what it was then. Do you know what I mean? Like, actually, right. mm -hmm. I don't know if the wrestlers today could handle wrestling then. Like the heels, yes. I doubt it. I, I, cause, I mean, if you know, I mean, I, I've heard the stories and, and I know a lot more than I should probably. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. also being someone who was a heel and getting that heel heat, I know how, how rowdy the fans can be when they're truly right. when you have that kind of thing oh, i don't yeah. know today if wrestlers today will get that you know back i i really don't think people understand like the impact of wrestling in different areas back especially back in the territory days like there is some place yeah i mean there's people who really believe they they thought what they saw was a, a thousand percent real and they lived and died by you know their heroes sure. and they in wrestling they rejected yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, I mean, you know, how many stories have, have we heard over the years about riots at shows or yep. uh, guys who were stabbed and shot at and spit it's, on it's, and yeah. whatever? And I it's mean, that was, you know, I, I was friends with the late hero Matsuda. Mm. And I asked him one day, I said, you know, how did it feel that people want to kill you? And he <laughs> would say, because he spoke in broken English, oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, I love more they do it, more I love it. Oh. You know, so and and I, I get it. I get it. You know, it just showed that they were successful at what it is that they were supposed to be doing. And, uh, you know, you, you, you have an appreciation for that, you know. Sure. You know, one of the things I think is amazing is, you know, when we have those legends and we have those people with big names, I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. that one of the things I like to do is try to give some knowledge I have to the younger guys who don't. Maybe there are guys today that you need a written script and you need these things. And I said, you don't need that. 
just right. channel that and build it into yourself. You, one mm-hmm, of the things mm-hmm. I think that the problem with the heel thing is people are given something that they don't truly believe in. You're and, absolutely right. And, or they're not committed to it. Like you'll hear stories about like Terry Taylor, for example, when he was a red rooster and how he was so opposed to that character, but she, on the on there's two sides of that spectrum because you go in one area and Terry Taylor is a very well known respected wrestler, but mm-hmm, in WWE mm-hmm. you see the Red Rooster and you know Cockadoodle Doo and all these other things you know I mean right, but that aspect of it you know there are stories if he fully embraced that I mean I don't really know how far you could go with you know a Red Rooster that character I mean how much more could you do, but. On that aspect, if he fully committed to it, maybe. Uh, you, you know what I mean by that? I'm like, the people who are. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean things. by it. I, I thought it was pretty ridiculous. But, and, and no I, I sympathize I sympathize with Terry Taylor because Terry sure. Taylor was, was a good hand. He was popular. He was over in Mid South. Yeah. He was over just being Terry Taylor. Right. Why that wasn't good enough, you yeah. know, is, is a whole other issue. But, you know, those were the times, and that's what 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 Vince McMahon wanted to get across, and you know, that's what they made him do, and he he did it because that was his job. So you know, it is what it is. But cool. uh, you know, some guys embraced it and 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 made it work. And look at Dusty Rhodes with the polka Dusty dots Rhodes and the common the man and all that. Of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and some was- guys like like poor Terry Taylor. Right. It just didn't didn't click. Or so. uh, seven hundred other guys who you know were really good talents. Other places they go mm-hmm. there and like, what are you doing there? Um, like you know, um, Steve Kern is a good example of that. Right, wild male Steve Kern. I mean, or even Matt Bourne. I mean, come on, Matt Bourne right. is a natural heel. He had some good heat there. Mm-hmm. Then you get over there and you make him a clown. Literally, they made him a clown. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You know, in all these other hands that were really talented that mm. just kind of, you know, give them a character. Sometimes you you give someone a character, you're kind of setting them up for failure. I mean, because there's only so much you can do with that. I mean, what are you supposed to do with a Mantar? Right. I mean, what are you supposed to do? How far can you? I mean, OK, you play hockey. What? How does that, you know, impact a wrestling world? Yeah, hockey right, right, fight, right. you know. Mm-hmm. The goon, yeah, yeah. The goon, which was, you know, yeah. okay. And the right. 700 other gimmicks that are like, why? What are you going to do with that? Yeah. It's a gimmick. Yeah. Which is I mean, all like, like you say, some of them clicked and some of them, yeah, not so much. Have you? What, Abe Knuckleball opinion, Schwartz. Yeah, another good one. So yeah. in your opinion, yeah. that's a good, really good one. In your opinion now, because you've, you've been in the wrestling world a while and you've seen all the gimmicks. In your in your opinion, what do you think is the most ridiculous character in your opinion, your wrestling that you've experienced, you've seen so far? Boy. I thought Abe Knuckleball Schwartz was pretty ridiculous. Yeah, that was up there. Space painted up like a baseball. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty silly, but yeah, what can I tell you? That's yeah. a good one. That's a good one right there. Uh, WCW had Oz. That's pretty silly. Us. And of course, the Shockmaster. Who could forget the Shockmaster? That poor guy. <laughs> He's yeah. actually a really good guy, uh, Fred. But uh, unfortunately, but, uh, yeah. you know, I think that there's sometimes when those instances happen, you're kind of labeled to that. You know, kind of like mm. Scott Steiner, who Scott Steiner is someone who a lot of people respect in the tag team world. I mean, I used to like to tell people I knew Scott Steiner before he found. Uh, you know, he got into the gym, as we say. Uh, right, right, right. You know what I mean? But, yeah, exactly. But what I thought was funny, you know, a lot of people, when they think of Scott Steiner, they always think of that one promo in, in TNA with the whole Steiner math thing, which is, mm-hmm. yeah, well, that's why some people just had managers. <laughs> so, right, right, right. right. But, you mm-hmm. know, whatnot. Um, also trying to keep track of your time. I don't want to keep you too long, my friend. So I, you know, I want to value you here. We appreciate you on here uh, and whatnot. And make sure, well, before we have you go, we're going to have you make sure you tell everyone whatnot. Now, as far as NECW goes, do you still go to the events at all? Or I know you're not longer really promoting a part of it. Do you go down there? Do you yeah. Watch I, I, no, I, I see a couple of events every now and then. Uh, last week, I went to see Proving Ground up in uh, Beverly. 
mm. where, where we used to run, not in the same building, but we used to run up in Beverly. And I saw their show. And Todd Graham, who's the promoter of that, is a good kid, does a really good job. Uh, I'm going uh, a week from Saturday to see Focus Pro Wrestling. I don't know very much about it, but uh, you know, I've seen the NCW. They're, they run up in Dedham, which is very close to where I live. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I sometimes I pop into that, you know. But I, I do see some local shows. And what I find, Sean, to be perfectly honest with you, it, it, a lot of these shows are very, very similar to each other. You know, yeah. It's the same talent yeah. in, from one show to the next. And, you know, everybody has their own different take on their booking and, and whatnot. But it's the same. But, story, right. It, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's so interchangeable. And and, you know, the, fortunately, I mean, the, a lot of these guys are drawing pretty well. I mean, they're doing pretty well as far mm-hmm. as, you know, drawing crowds goes. But, mm-hmm. you know, the other thing about it is that none of them are really really standing out from each other right i always tried to make any cw stand out mm-hmm. and it did. we were doing we were doing actual broadcast television at mm-hmm. one point we were doing we had that deal with comcast where we were doing mm-hmm. the comcast on demand stuff for a year i mean we were we were trying to be something you know, uh, uh, smarter than the average bear, so to speak. You know, we were trying to be something a little bit bigger, a little bit better. Our talent choices, we we always tried to have some unique talent. Well, you have some uh, talent, yeah. I'll give you yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some folks you didn't see uh, every place else, you know, uh, and, and people that we kind of put on the map by allowing them to do the things that they do, so... I mean, I, I see that. I see less of that now. Yeah. In, in a lot of these local groups. And, and not that they're doing anything wrong, because they're not. I mean, you know, if you, you like Beverly Wrestling, it's Beverly Wrestling. If you like, right. <laughs> you know, uh, Everett Wrestling, it's Everett Wrestling. That's that's sure. nothing wrong with it. But if you really want to, like, have an impact and stand out, you, you got to do you got to go the extra mile and, and I don't, I'm not seeing a lot of that. Yeah. And I agree with you on that one. I've, Hmm. I sadly, because I've been so busy with, you know, 700 other things between this podcast, the YouTube show, which takes up a lot anyway, then anti-bullying speech is everywhere. I do a Hmm. lot of the, you know, doing a lot of anti-bullying talks at the schools and stuff like that. And also once in a while I'll go and um, give seminars on how to talk and how to do promos and stuff here and there. Mm. But for the most part, I mean, a lot of the wrestling is kind of the same kind of thing. The other thing I see is a lack of passion for the company. What I mean by that is a lot of guys now, because, you know, the independent circuit, you want to make as much money as you can. And like back when you ran NECW, when you were booked at NECW, you were there from open to close, bell to bell. A lot of these guys have this new practice where they come in for their match. They'll leave right after they get paid up and they leave and they go to another show somewhere else. And then, they, right, right. you know, when it, there's no loyalty in wrestling business in that. Do you right, understand what I mean? Right. Like you, you, you absolutely hit on something very important. There, you need to no... have loyalty and you need to have right. that passion for what you're doing and for the people you're doing it with. Well, you, you can't expect people to just work for you and nobody else. That's unrealistic. Right, but I mean, but they're committed. The, the sanctity it. of promotions is not as respected as it used to be. Right, and 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 that's kind of unfortunate. I, I think that, you know, uh, I, I see a lot of these guys who are we used to call them ring whores, you know, who would just work everywhere. If you had a, a show and you were offered them, oh, I'll I'll go, I'll I'll do it, I'll mm-hmm. I'll work, you know. Right, and they didn't care. They didn't care if they were champion in, in, in your group and, and jobbing out in the opening match in the next group, you know, six miles up the road. It, it, it didn't matter to them. Mm. They just wanted to wrestle and get paid and roll around and be in front of a crowd. And I think that, that that's, you know, the, the, the ability to build yourself up into the kind of attraction that people say, yeah, I want to go pay and see him. Right. That's exactly you know, yeah. That's gone. Locally. it is and it's that's sad. It, it, it's it's sad it is very it sad is. yeah i don't see a lot of that these days so yeah you you hit the nail on the head with that perfectly i mean i've seen it 
it was a growing thing when I was kind of getting, when I was kind of wrapping up the first time around in 2019, I'm looking around and, you know, you go to like a lot of us taught, you know, you show up at a show, you book for that show, you're there for that show. And you build on that character. You do you your best to build that brand there. Do you know what right. I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you, a lot of the guys you used, I mean, I could say are synonymous with an ECW. Guys like Pat the Brad Piper, Rick Fuller, Slick Wagner Brown. A lot of those cu- cut their teeth in an ECW. Then there was me here and there when I popped up here once in a blue moon. But mm-hmm. when you what you did for a lot of people is give people their moments and people believed in those people and yeah, you might see a Rick Fuller somewhere else, but you know that when they were in ECW, that he wasn't going to be down the road. You know, DC I mean? Dillinger, God rest his soul. Another one, DC Dillinger. Who, so who, many of the guys. Would be, yeah. Eddie Richter. Edwards. Eddie Edwards, another one. Yeah. TJ yeah. Richter, I just saw recently, and people didn't yeah. know who he was anymore. Mm-hmm. And I knew who he was like off the bat because I remember him in an ECW. And um, he's a referee, by the way, and I don't know if you knew he's a ring. He's a doing yep. a referee thing down here in Rhode Island now, which you know mm-hmm. it was nice to see him. But nobody knew who he was. And yeah, you know, yeah, there's yeah. that that new fan base. It's like, but I think I don't blame that on you know T.J. Richter. That's not his fault. That's you know that's the business. And like, but like when right. you go to NECW, you know the guys at NECW. You know the Rick mm-hmm, Fullers, mm-hmm. and the, you know the right. These are household names, thanks to people like yourself for building them that way. Right. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of people understand how valuable that is. And when you don't have that passion for the places that are giving you that opportunity, it follows you. And you're just, like you said, a ring whore or a wicked warrior or, you know, you're in it for the wrong reason, really. You don't learn anything from that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You're just trying to think that you're going to be big on this. And you're kind of fulfilling that that fake philosophy that you're going to build on what the more eyeballs see you, you're going Mm -hmm. to be big. But in reality, it it started changing about seven or eight years ago. Yeah, I would agree with that. I noticed it. I noticed it on my shows and we were doing television and and some of these guys who were experienced and really. You know, they just didn't appreciate the fact that, you know, they were being seen on local television, that nobody else was giving them that. Right. And, and our shows, even though, you know, it was an obscure TV station on YouTube, we were getting tens of thousands of views every week. Yeah. And and one guy, and I won't mention his name, you know, he, he did an interview with a big website and he didn't even mention us. And I said, hey, you were on a show last week that 30,000 people watched. When was the last time 30,000 people saw you do anything? Mm. And the least you could do is say, hey, watch me on this. Oh, oh I dressed him down in front of everybody, and, and he was upset about it. But I was right. You know, you, you are. Where's the, you know, what are you doing? Right. What, what, why am I doing this for you if you don't appreciate it? Exactly. So, you know, but there were a lot of guys that did appreciate it. Yeah, and I think if you go back on YouTube and you watch the shows that we did, you know, seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, ten years ago, they hold up. They They hold up very well. They do, and and they're memorable. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, I'm very proud of those. I'm proud of the guys that that we had at the time. So, uh, you know, like I say, the business has changed. It hasn't always changed for the better. Right. And I think a little a little dose of old school every now and then here and there is, is a good, a good thing. thing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I think you exactly said, kind of one of the things that I think is the biggest point that I like to try to point out is we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people like yourself. A lot of these guys forget who gave them their mm-hmm. spots, who gave them that ring time, who made them. I am someone who always takes a moment to thank those who got us where we are. I don't magically become a wrestler. You don't just magically walk into a building and do those Mm -hmm. things. Those takes other people to help me get there. You know what I mean? And one of the things I mean, Sean, I I, I always thought, Sean, I always thought I was fortunate to have worked with the people that I got a chance to work with. Right. You know, I, I, I worked with some terrific people over the years. All you have to do is, is look at, at who wrestled for NECW. And go down that list. In okay. fact, uh, if, if you uh, want to go on YouTube after this, 
to our YouTube channel, which is NECW Wrestling, all one word, uh, you'll find the uh, NECW 20th Anniversary Collection, which is 20 matches that, that summarize 20 years of New England Championship Wrestling. And just look at who's on those matches and, and some of the stuff that not just the big names before right. they became famous, sure. but some of the locals who right. did the best work of their careers. Right. Uh, it, it'll, 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 if you're not familiar, it'll shock you at, at, at who was there and the things that local people did that really, really put local wrestling on the map. I think it's important. And it's a sad thing that a lot of people forget those things. I am someone yeah. who always respects those who give us those opportunities. Why? I saw you at New England Fan Fest. One of the first things I said was, thank you, Sheldon. I want to thank you for everything you've done. Because if it wasn't for people like you, and, and actually I saw Slick at the same show. Mm-hmm. Every time I see Slick Wagner Brown, because remember, he tra- he was one of the people who trained me. I thank right. him for that. Sure. That loyalty, that respect, that's something that I mm-hmm. always like mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. intervene because that's something I was always taught. So I want to say yeah. thank you for all that. Publicly, I want to say thank you for all you've done for me particularly but for all of those people who I know personally who have valued from what you have given them. And I don't think there's a lot of people in New England who want to be considered to be New England wrestlers who haven't had at least a stint in NECW during your time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as someone who you know has seen NECW, I went from a fan and then once in a while I'll pop up there is the other half of the things. I want to say thank you for everything you've done for you know, me particularly, but then all of the other people whether they know it or not, they if they they wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for people like you giving them that opportunity. Because I appreciate that. It's important. I appreciate that for us to remember where we started. Yeah. I myself, I understand where you're coming from. I've taken that time. I've had people who I've, you know, had to, you know, I've took it on the wing. I've showed them something, and they've kind of forgot all about anything because mm-hmm. you know it's their thing and whatever. But in reality. I don't take that to heart. I'm like, you know, whatever. I'm glad that I was able to help them when I could, but I'm not that person. When I, you know, when I see someone like a Sheldon Goldberg or a Slick Wagner Brown or someone who played a pivotal moment in my career, in my life, because I wouldn't, there wouldn't be a jazz fitness or a jazz vengeance or, and I wouldn't be doing the YouTube show. I wouldn't be doing any of this. The podcast doesn't exist without Mm -hmm. the people like yourself for helping to hone that in. So mm-hmm. I want to say thank you for that, for you know you what you've done for me and countless other people I know who have you know really appreciated everything you've done. So thank you for that. Also, thank you that. for thank inspiring you. me to kind of finish my book. Uh, okay, if Goldberg can do it. I will too. <laughs> there you go. And then when I'm done writing mine, I'll invite you to my launch party. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, Sheldon, before we let you go, I want to let you get, let people know what's coming up, where they can get this book, where they can find Sheldon Goldberg next and whatnot. Hey, well, uh, you can find me uh, on Facebook. You can find me on uh, Twitter or X, as they call it now, at NECW. Uh, are the uh, promotions uh, Facebook is NECW Wrestling. Um, you can... Uh, Find us on the web at necw.tv, where you can get all the information on the book. You can order an autograph copy on the website. And uh, if you just want to get the book, it's on Amazon. Just look up The Last Fall, Sheldon Goldberg. You'll find it. And uh, I hope you get a chance to read it, and I hope you enjoy it. Excellent. Well, Sheldon, I want to say thank you for, again, everything you've been. Thank you for coming on here um and thank you for writing this book and inspiring writers like myself also people in the wrestling world again thank you for all of that and also breaking that narrative that wrestlers are not smart or people in the wrestling business are not there's this underlying narrative that wrestlers or people in the pro wrestling world aren't intelligent because you know of what the things that we do in the wrestling world and i have never found that to be accurate quite that's usually a lot of intelligent guys yeah. Yeah. yeah So I want to say thank you for that and whatnot, Sheldon. I don't want to tie up for your Friday because you're a busy man and you got things to yep. do. But uh, you have a great weekend. It was a pleasure and an honor having you here. And everyone, go get the last fall. And I'll be seeing you, Mr. Goldberg, on November 9th at your launch party. I look forward to that. And uh, Thank you so much. Whatnot. Thank you. And All you right. have a great rest of your day. 
You too, my friend. Stay Holy good. Water. Till next time. And again, thank you. Yeah. Bye. See ya. All right. Well, Sean, take care. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Take care now. Yep. You too. Everyone, this is the icon, Sean Jazz Stevens. And again, I want to say thank you to Sheldon Goldberg for everything that he has done. And he had a lot of narratives that are accurate. And what he said is 100% facts. The wrestling business, the wrestling world um, has changed a lot. I noticed this. And Sheldon is someone who I've known for a long time and I have a lot of respect for. And I do encourage you guys to follow links and what he's and where he said to go. Um, the graphic I showed you in this video will show you that the last fall and you can go and be there at the Boston Elks Lodge on uh, Morrill Street on Roxbury, Mass. And you'll get an autographed copy from him and a gift. And it'll be a really good time. And I'll be there among other people who Sheldon has helped out over the years. And it's nice to give back to someone who's given so much to the wrestling world. Uh, whether people know it or not, if it wasn't for people like Sheldon Goldberg, none of us exist. Um, and he is correct. Around the time that he's talking about is right when I started seeing that influx of people who kind of forgot about who we are, what we are. Um, I think it's important to remember if it wasn't for people like, you know, Sheldon and countless other people, our coaches, our trainers, and, and like his book, isn't necessarily all just a wrestling fan. Anybody outside of the wrestling world can also relate to this. I think the message, the underlying lesson that we're both trying to, you know, what I'm trying to convey is me personally is to give thanks to those who helped us get to where we are. I wouldn't know as much about martial arts if it wasn't for my senseis taking that time to teach me the skills that I do. I wouldn't be able to protect myself and have the confidence that I have that I can walk down any street anywhere and have the confidence that I am safe because I can handle myself and others probably. And if it wasn't for my coaches on any of these sports teams, whether it be football, AKA soccer, um, swim team, wrestling squad, basketball, softball, volleyball, bowling, all of those things. None of those things happen without someone guiding me to get there. My coaches, my trainers, my teachers. When I was in high school, my English teacher inspired me to continue writing. She believed in me so much that she entered my, my short story on my behalf to a contest, which ended up winning and representing my city. And I was only 18 at the time, or no, 19. I was 19 at the time when she had my story published in a book that represents my city with people who, in a book that had featured our, um, authors from all walks in life in the, in the state. And, and obviously, I was one of the youngest people to be included in that. I was honored for that was because my English teacher believed in me. What you don't know is... Six, as I said before, six months, I'm actually celebrating this very month will be 21 years when I stepped in the, my first year walking into the, the halls of Kowalski School, walking down those stairs into that area where Kowalski trained many people, including myself. And this is the month that I celebrate that 20 plus year career. And if it wasn't for Kowalski, Slick Wagner Brown, April Hunter, all of those people given that time and that opportunity to help me learn my voice, learn my craft. And also, if it wasn't for guys like Brett the Hitman Hart, uh, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, um, all honesty, Shawn Michaels, guys who weren't the, necessarily the biggest guys in the world, Owen Hart, the legendary Owen Hart. Brian Pillman, rest his soul. All of these people who are, might not have been the biggest human beings, the tallest guys. It's important to remember if it wasn't for those guys, guys who were like me, who were six feet tall, and at that point, 210 pounds soaking wet, I wasn't able, I wouldn't be in the wrestling world because the wrestling world was always considered to be this big, gigantuan people. And it was thanks to guys like Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, the guys who weren't the biggest guys in the world 
who opened the door for guys like myself who weren't the biggest guy in the world, but I had a heart that matched the rest of me. So there was that. And the skill set that I had matched the rest. Um, I want to say, Sheldon, I've known for a long time. Prior to me getting into the wrestling world, um, I had talked to Sheldon. I said, Sheldon, I'm going to get into wrestling. And he said, you will probably. And it was an honor to work with Sheldon over the years, a learning from Sheldon. He is a wealth of knowledge. He demonstrated some of it today with his facts that he knows. Um, he is a wrestling historian. And if it wasn't for people like Sheldon having that knowledge, and he, he, you heard from another person who isn't me about Walter Killer Kowalski and his impact on wrestling, but also the impact on everybody else around him. Um, that wasn't a gimmick. There are a lot of people who forget where they came from, who helped them get there. I'm not someone who does that. I am honored and privileged and honored to have the training and know the people that I have over the years. I don't forget where I came from. I just build on it and make them all proud. So with that, that concludes the video portion of this show.